Hello, so this is part two of the uh, chi-square test uh, lecture and pivot table lecture for Social Work 204. And um, we'll get right to it. So by jumping back into the lecture. So here we are. This is, we just did the demonstration. So what is the chi-square test for? The chi-square test is intended to how likely it is to observe a distribution due to chance. This is called a goodness of fit statistic because it measures how well observed distribution of the data fits with the distribution that is expected. In other words, what we just did in Excel, we had the expected table and the observed table. And the expected table is the mathematical cal calculations. It's saying, okay, if everything is held constant, then in order that, in order that we're, we're controlling for variables, then we expect this to come out of it. Now, if things are different, the observed will reflect a difference. And recall facility, recall the robbery data, where it's like there really wasn't any difference anyway. So you know, we get a high P value of 0.99. So a chi-square test is designed to analyze categorical data. That means that the data has been counted and divided into categories. It will not work with parametric or continuous data, such as high inches. Uh, we don't have to recode age into categories. So like, you know, 21 through 23 would be a category, for example. So we will move forward to the next slide. For example, if you want to test whether attending class influences how students perform an exam, using test scores from 0 to 100 as data would not be appropriate for chi-square. However, arranging category students into a category pass or fail would. Additionally, the data in chi-square grid should not be in form percentages or anything other than frequency. Thus, by dividing a class of 54 into groups according to whether they attend a class and whether they pass the exam, you might construct a data set like this. You see it's kind of exactly like a yes, no data. Did they attend or did they skip? Pass, fail. So if you attend a class, 25 passed and six failed. But if you skip class, eight passed and 15 failed. We can already see a pretty decent difference there by eyeballing it. So for the important thing here is be very careful with your when you're constructing your categories. A chi-square test can tell you information based on how you divide up the data. And I'm going to move my, my camera image real quick to the top of the screen. I'm going to make it a little smaller too. So that being said, uh, be careful when you're constructing your categories. A chi-square test can tell you information based on how you divide up the data. And it, can, it cannot tell you whether the categories you're constructing are meaningful. So, in other words, when you're coding your data, be very careful on how you code it and make sure your categories make sense. For example, if you're working with data groups on people, you can divide them into age groups, 18 through 25, 26 through 40, 41 through 60, or income level. But the chi-square test will treat those divisions between those categories exactly the same. It holds no discrimination. It's like, oh, it's a 36-year-old to 40. They're the same thing as 21 to 25-year-olds. So make sure your categories make sense, okay? Uh, as division between male and female or alive and dead. It's up to you to assess whether your categories make sense and whether the difference, for example, between age 25 and 26 is enough to make the category 18 through 25 and 26 through 40 meaningful. So when you're breaking those down, you can definitely tell the difference between an 18 year old and a 20 year old, 18 through 20, than a 30 through 35 year old, or they behave differently. Uh, if there are different stages in their life, they have different, you know, like one's going to college and the other's, you know, working. Uh, well, you get an 18 year old that's working full time too, but it's just there's still different stages in their life and they'll have different, you know, experiences at that point in time. And that does shape how you behave. So there is something to think about. Make sure that you, uh, your categories make sense and that they're, they're comparable. You know, like I said right here, if you're, if you're comparing male and female and dead and alive, it's not really something you should do. It's not the same thing. So moving forward, another way to describe the chi-square test is that it tests the null hypothesis that the variables are independent. The test compares the observed data to a model that distributes the data according to the expectation that the variables are independent. Wherever the observed data doesn't fit the model, the likelihood that the variables are independent becomes stronger, thus proving the null hypothesis incorrect. The following table would be re uh, represent a possible input to the chi-square test. Using two variables to divide the data, gender and party affiliation, two by two grids like this one are actually a basic example for the chi-square test. But in actuality, any size grid will work well, three by three, four by two, whatever have, whatever have you. So this shows a basic two by two grid. However, it's an actually incomplete in a sense. Generally, you want to have your marginal, which is like, you know, the totals on the sides there. So information given the total counts for column and row, as well as for the whole data set. 
showing as in the bottom image. We now have a complete data set on distribution of 100 individuals in the categories of gender. You're male or female, or your party affiliation, Democrat or Republican. A chi-square test would then allow you to test how likely it is that the gender and party affiliation are completely independent, or in other words, how likely that is the distribution of male and females in each party is due to chance. So as implied, the null hypothesis is the case that it would be that the gender and party affiliation are independent of one another. In other words, uh, they don't matter when it comes to like your decision making. So to test this hypothesis, we need to construct a model which estimates how the data should be distributed if our hypothesis of independence is correct. This is where the total we put in margins become handy. In other words, we now are calculating um, that expected uh, range that we did earlier. So using statistical tests without having a good idea of what it can and cannot do means that you may misuse the test. So, but it also means that you won't clear a grasp of what results you mean. So even if you don't understand the detailed mathematics underlying the test, it's not difficult to have a good comprehension of where it is or is inappropriate to use. Remember that chi-square is not for interval ratio comparison. I mean, you can code it down to category from interval ratio, so you can do it still. But if you have um, that kind of data, you're better off doing another type of analysis. So first of all, the chi-square test is only meant to test the probability of independence. It will not tell you any details about the relationship between them. In other words, you know, as one increases, the other decreases. You won't get that from chi-square. If you want to calculate how much more likely it is that a woman will be a Democrat than a man, then the chi-square test is not going to be very helpful. However, once you have determined the probability that two variables are related using that chi-square test, you can use other tests to explore that interaction in more detail. The variables you consider must be mutually exclusive. A participation in one category should not entail or, or allow participation in another. In other words, the data from your cells should be added to the total count and no item should be counted twice. So don't overlap your data when you're asking. Remember that problem we had uh, with uh, age, if you, if you construct your categories as age 20 through 23 and 23 through 20, 20 26, you're counting 23 year olds twice, which is not what you want to be doing. So make sure you're separating you know, your age groups actually being 18 through 22 and 23 through 25. That way you don't count two people twice. So you should, only, one person twice. You should also never exclude some part of your data set. If you study to examine males and females registered Republican, Democrat, and independent, then excluding one category from the grid might conceal critical data about the distribution of your data. In other words, you need, uh, let's say we are doing the Republican, Democrat, and independent, well, you may also need another category to, you know, fulfill other, to give other people that chance to respond to that. It, it matters a lot that you, you count everything, because if you don't count everything, then your data is going to be off. So your degrees of freedom, think degrees of freedom as a way of keeping score, and as a data set it contains the number of observations, say, you know, in representing how many you got. So they constitute in individual pieces of information. These pieces of information can be used to estimate their par parameters or variability. In general, each item being estimated costs one degree of freedom. The remaining degrees of freedom are used to estimate variability. All we have to do is count. A single sample, there are n observations, so there's one parameter, which is the mean, in this case, that needs to be estimated. That leaves n minus one degrees of freedom for estimating variability. So for two samples, you've got n nth of one plus nth of two observations. There are two means to be estimated. That leaves nth of 1 plus nth of 2 minus 2. Do you see the pattern here? You have two categories, it's minus 2. Degrees of freedom for estimating variability. Typically, degrees of freedom equals your sample size minus the number of parameters you need to calculate during the analysis. It is usually a positive whole number. Those parameters are nth of 1 or nth of 2, and nth of, or just your nth. nth minus 1, or their nth of 1 plus nth of 2 minus 2. See, the minus 2 represents how many uh, parameters you're looking at or variables. So you need to calculate during analysis. It is usually a positive whole number, and your parameters are numeral characteristic of population as, a distinct for, uh, as distinct from a statistic of a sample. You can just think about it as a variable, really, you know, your gender. So degrees of freedom, often abbreviated as DF or D, tell you how many numbers in your grid are actually independent. So for your chi-square grid, the degrees of freedom can be said to be the number of cells you needed to fill in before, given the total in the margins, you can fill in the rest using grid formula. You can see the idea intended here. If you have a given set of totals for each column and row, then you don't have unlimited freedom when filling the cells. So let's say that you can only fill in a certain amount of cells with random numbers before the rest just become dependent on making sure the cells add up to totals. Thus, the number of cells that you can be filled independently tells us something about the actual amount of variation permitted by the data set. So this is just a way of checking your, your, um, your variation in a way. 
and you know it's just explained n minus one in the kind of like the mathy bits behind chi square. Don't have to worry too much about it, honestly. So the degree of freedom for chi square grid are equal to the number of rows minus one time the number of columns minus one. That is r r minus one times c minus one. In our simple two by two grid, the degrees of independence therefore are two minus one times two minus one or one. Note that once you put the numbers into one cell, two by two grid, the total, the, the total determines the rest for you. Degrees of freedom are important in chi-square tests because they factor into your calculations of the probability of independence, or if you know no hypothesis is rejected or not. Once you calculate that chi-square value, you use this number and the degree of freedom to, de to decide the probability or your p-value. This is a crucial result of the chi-square test that means knowing the degree of freedom is absolutely crucial. Now that we've sidetracked in the degree of freedom, we're going back to chi-square. Earlier, I showed you a simple example of observed versus expected data. So using an artificial data set on the party affiliations of males and females, I will show them again below. You have their, the data sets. Then we will focus on a, based on the null hypothesis that the distribution of data is due by chance. That is, our models will reflect the expected distribution of data when the hypothesis is assumed to be true. But as I mentioned before, the case of dividing up this data is due to simply see the distribution I choose. So how do we calculate that expected distribution of a more complicated set? Now if you need to see how this works in action again, refer back to part one of the lecture. So here is the grid for an example, earlier example I discussed, showing how students who attended or skipped class performed an exam. The number for this example are not so clean. Fortunately, we have a formula to guide us. So the estimated value for each cell is the total for its row, multiplied for the total of its column, then divided by the total for the table. That is, row total times column total divided by grid total. Thus, in our table above, the expected count in cell 11 is 33 times 31 divided by 54, or 18.94. Don't be afraid that for decimals for expected counts, they're meant to be estimates. In other words, you will see decimals, even though if you're working with completely whole numbers, it's okay to see a decimal. This is just estimates, okay? So it's time to put our data to the test. You can find programs that will calculate cost square for you. However, and later I will show you how to do an Excel. I did that for you earlier, actually, this time. For now, however, let's start by trying to understand the formula itself, because it's x squared. Chi squared equals sigma eth of 1, and then you can divide by oath. O phi minus e sub 1 squared divided by e sub 1. So the variable and the formula are not sim sim simply symbols, but actual concepts that we've been discussing all along. O stands for observed frequency. E stands for expected frequency. You subtract the expected count from the observed count to find the difference between the two, also called the residual. Then you calculate the square of that number to get rid of the positive and negative values because the squares of 5 and negative 5 are, of course, both 25. You get a positive value from that. And then you divide the result by the expected frequency to normalize bigger and smaller counts because we don't want a formula that will give us a bigger square, chi square or value but just because you're working with a bigger set of data. And the huge sigma sitting in front of that, all it's asking is to sum every ice or i for which you calculate this relationship. In other words, you calculate this for each cell on the table and then add it all together and that's it. So using this formula, we find that chi-square value for our gender slash party example is 20 minus 25 uh, squared, and squared divided by 25, plus 30 minus 325 squared divided by 25, plus 30 minus 25 squared divided by 25, you know, and it goes on plus 20 minus and divided, and you can see all that work there. And it comes out to be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which comes out to 4. What a very complicated root to get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Here is another example of chi-square in itself. You need to see a YouTube video that's not for me. And that will wrap up our, our chi-square discussion for the class. So I hope this, uh, this, this uh, video lecture was helpful for you. Um, please uh, enjoy it. And watch it and use this to do your best and I'll see you all next week.